So you all know about the topic is, you know, where should we start our research uh, and with the priorities of the nation, that's what everyone says. So let me take you uh, through what I think, you know. Uh, so the first question comes to anybody's mind or the particular the student's mind or when you do your PhD and do your postdoc and then you want to start your own lab, right? You want to start your own research. Where should I start, right? Uh, all of us who are in this business uh, go through this. And that obviously came to me also. And what I used to do is jot down things, you know, what, what I may like to do. And it would keep changing uh, every few months or six months. I said, no, no, I, maybe I'll try that. So it is most important about what we do, you know. <clears throat> so one thing very important is that whatever you do, you must be very passionate about doing that, right? So two days back, we had a, a talk from Rich Roberts, who got the Nobel for identifying the split genes. And he essentially said the same thing, uh, that when I go to lab, I feel so nice. So my wife thinks that I'm going to work, but I'm not really going to work. I love what I, I'm doing, and if I have to stay back on Sunday, I'm not comfortable, you know, I'm thinking is when I'll go in the morning, you know, and keep thinking about that. So that's the kind of passion one should have, and therefore do what you really like to do, and if you start doing it as a job, then, you know, after a certain time, you're going to get bored with that, and you will change that. So that's very uh, important, right? The next thing is, you know, that where should we start, which one I would like to do is it's very important to identify the gaps and not become a clone that I did my postdoc in this and I'm going to keep continuing on that because then you're going to have a competition. And if you do that, you may not be able to compete with these people. So it's not good. And this actually slide, uh, I kind of borrowed, you can say, uh, uh, about a decade back, Bruce uh, was here, was, uh, you know, uh, editor of the science, and he said, don't try to become a clone. These are, these are his, his words, you know. Try, try to see uh, the gaps and try to do something. Even if you're trying to approach a problem which others are doing, it's always important to approach through a different angle. Because if you do exactly the same what others are doing and use the same approach to answer that, you are essentially going to get the same results, right? So it's not, it's not a good idea to use the same methodology, same technique, and approach the same problem. Try and use different approach. And if you do that, then you may get the answer which the others are not getting, and that may add to feel, and you'll get excited about it, uh, what you are doing. So my interest is in immunology. Uh, and, you know, so we all know uh, this part is that the, you know, viruses need a host for uh, survival and propagation, and in turn we know that the host have immune barriers to protect themselves, right? So now, <clears throat> do we really understand what kind of barriers we have? Do we know everything about that? The, the, the answer is not really completely, right? <clears throat> and why so? What, what, why we don't really understand? And if you see and read the history, historically, we scientists always use a reductionist approach. So people who were doing acquired immunity, you know, T-cell biologists or B-cell, they would do only that and not look at the innate immunity. And people who were doing innate immunity would just restrict themselves to looking at the uh, innate immunity, so much so that People are injecting the antigens with the adjuvant. You know, you have the mycobacteria and that. And uh, you would say, oh, this response is this. And, you know, Jenbe used to say, uh, immunologist's dirty secret, that you are giving something more, but you don't want to acknowledge that you are giving something more, right? Everybody was in a very tight domain and not trying to look at how the whole thing is really working. So <clears throat> what is missing as a result? The missing as a result is we don't understand that all these systems, you know, different systems work together. 
and that results in a response and not one thing specific. It's not just the antigen alone that gives you a response, correct? And therefore, unless there is a crosstalk, and unless we really understand how different pathways come together in crosstalk, we are not really going to understand how the immune system works, right? One thing we know, that the live vaccines work better. You generate a better immune response when you use live vaccines compared to the killed vaccines. But do we really understand everything about why they work better? The answer, again, is not entirely. So let me take you through one by one. Uh, uh, the questions which you, know, you may have in your mind is how the immune response is maintained. Do we really understand the, how the immune response is maintained? And now it, it's fresh in your memory that you know, we are giving. And during the pandemic, we, we came to know that, well, immune, immune response is not quite maintained. It's getting dropped. Do we still have antibodies? Do you still have immunity? No, 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 not really. And why is that? Why we don't really understand? So let me give you one example uh, from the Bali Pulindran's work. So what we know that yellow fever vaccine, you know, it gives pretty good response in which stayed for years together. And if you see, this is the antibody response is long term. Why do we have it, right? So what he did is he used omics approach to understand really what is getting activated, what is crosstalk, and he came up with a molecule called GCN2, which is a nutrition deprivation center, uh, the, the sensor. And that is sitting inside the dendritic cells, and dendritic cells, as a result of activation of this, is able to do better antigen presentation to, to the T cells. And that is giving a better response, right? So uh, we know a lot of these vaccines. For example, smallpox gives much better vaccination, although it has been stopped in 1980, and uh, the young population doesn't have, and those who even got it also don't really have a response right now. It's more than 40 years. Yellow fever, measles, rubella, all these, they give much better results. So should we you, you know, try and learn immunology from this? May not be a bad approach, right, to start with. And many people are trying to do this. What constitutes protective immunity? So I chose this example of SARS-CoV-2 because it's fresh in everyone's mind, right? So initially, uh, we learned that antibodies do a good job, and that started, that led to the plasma, convulsant plasma therapy. Everyone was trying and giving this, and then we understand, well, it doesn't work quite well. And then said, well, it's not just the antibodies, the T cells and the antibodies both, you know, you have to have, and then you, that will lead to a good response and, and so on and so forth. And then what we learned that kids who are not immunized, they are doing much better. And that surprised everyone is why kids are not getting affected as much as the adults and they are able to resist infection, they're doing much better job. And they are, you know, uh, eliminating the virus much better. What is the reason? Is it the innate immunity? Kids are better. They have not as much developed acquired immunity compared to innate, innate immunity. So is it the innate immunity that is, their innate lymphoid cells activity is much better. So is that the one which is better and protecting us against SARS or is, there, is that the antibodies of the T cells? Or is it that the kids develop immune response much quicker and if they do that, maybe that's the reason they do that. The question is still open and we don't really have an answer for this. What about the mucosal immunity, right? So we are getting intranasal infection. The, obviously, the, you know, what is going to be important is also the mucosal immunity. We are getting immunized. Do we really develop a good mucosal immunity? The answer is no. So there's a nice nature uh, uh, science immunology a paper which is read that if you give mRNA vaccine, you develop pretty good response, but not so much as a mucosal. And then, obviously, they are not protected by the variants when you get the variant. But if you take, do the same experiment in mice, for example, give mRNA, develop the antibody, and they are not getting protected with the variants. But if you give adenovirus intranasally in the vaccine, and, you know, S protein is there, and you make a response, now you are getting better protected, right? So what does it tell you? It, it tells you that 
along with the immune response, what, you, what we see in the, in the systemic thing, it's also important to develop a mucosal immunity, and therefore we need to learn about that. Adjuvants is another area in immunology we don't really have. We have only a handful of adjuvants, which we, everyone uses, right? And TLR, uh, uh, thanks to Jane Wayne and other people, TLR ligands is, you know, now also we have, which was also used, by the way, for the co-vaccine. So should we search for something called molecular adjuvants? What, what do we mean by molecular adjuvants? That the molecules that enhance, for example, innate immunity, or the antigen presentation, or you know, chemical response, or proliferation, differentiation, so on and so forth, should we look for these kind of molecules and give them along with the antigen we are giving? But what is important? Is that the one molecule is important? Or is it a mixture of things you need to give important, right? Still, it's open question, right? So we do give the TLR ligands, we do give the GMCSF, which are in clinical trial, but is that enough? Or do we see, you know, there are so many molecules there can be which we can identify and then try and see, and how do we identify? Learn, uh, maybe during, you know, vaccines which are much better, the live vaccines and so on and so forth, or from the patients, but then that's still open. Another problem, uh, antigenic variability, we know, uh, I just have two minutes, so I'm gonna skip uh, a lot of things. We know that the viruses mutate, and if you take the influenza virus, you know, it's a segmented genome, and therefore, there can be reassortment, and you can get something normal, like we had H1N1, right, in 2009. Uh, so it's, we learn genomic surveillance is very important, but what we also learn that it's not enough. We need to have also understand if we have a variance, how good is the transmission is there, or how disease severity is there. Just understanding what is circulating is not good enough, but we also need to collect this data, put it together to really understand what we have. So should we make a universal vaccine? If we have to have protection against all the variants, the answer is yes, but where do you start? How do you start, right? Still open question. Um, host variability, we know that that can be heritable or non-heritable, so many things, actually polymorphism, immune response, gene variation, uh, you know, impact uh, of the mother to newborn, um, micronutrients, macronutrients, uh, environmental infections, microbiome, right? Um, so the question is, how does the immune response varies? And all these things vary, you know, we, we, if you see the genetics, we had, you know, down south, Indian, uh, uh, Asian Indians, or, and, and from the north coming, and there is a mix, and which pretty much stayed uh, as pockets because, you know, marriages were in particular communities, so we do have this variability. How does the immune response vary in this? Do we really have a data? Somewhere one can start. Does it vary, or is that everyone gives you a pretty good immune response? Do we have a data for that, right? So I want to stop, a lot of questions uh, uh, are there, which you can think about that, and this is just the tip of the iceberg, which I tried to show you, just to give you a glimpse of, you know, how to think about the problems and where one can start. So I'll stop here, thank you very much.